Good evening, everyone. My name is Sean Casey. I am the director of the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. Uh, we are navigating the vicissitudes of the competency of DC taxi drivers. We, we have one panelist who is on campus, uh, was dropped off in a different location than here, so uh, he is in transit, and, and I'm going to introduce everybody in a second. So we thought we'd go ahead and get started, and so Teddy will be joining us uh, in, in mid-sentence, but, but anyway, we thought we'd go ahead and, and start. Uh, so uh, on behalf of the Berkeley Center and our partners at the Pulitzer Center of Crisis Reporting, I want to welcome you to tonight's event, Before Ferguson and Beyond Ferguson. In just a moment, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about our speakers, but first let me introduce the wider context uh, for, for this event. Since the 2017-2018 academic year, the Berkeley Center has been a part of the Pulitzer Center's campus consortium. Each year, as part of this partnership, uh, we host two events that bring Pulitzer Center grantee journalists to campus to discuss their remarkable reporting work, and we also sponsor an annual international reporting fellowship for one Georgetown student. Uh, applications are currently open, and I hope that's why we have a lot of undergraduates in, in the audience today, uh, for the 2020 fellowship, and all current Georgetown students are eligible to apply. We encourage you, if you're interested, to pick up a flyer outside uh, after you leave today, and there's also an information session happening at 6.30, or maybe actually a little later, uh, since we're getting a late start, at the conclusion of tonight's conversation, just down the hallway in McGuire 304. So as you exit, that'll be uh, to your right and then to your left. And if you're interested, we hope you'll, you'll spend some time there. And Ann Peters is here from the Pulitzer Center to talk about uh, what the, the, the fellowship is like. Uh, now let me briefly introduce our speakers this evening. Richard, or Dick Weiss, uh, has more than three decades of experience as a writer and editor uh, at newspapers, with much of that time spent at the St. Louis Post-Dispatch in recent years. Uh, he's currently working on a reporting project titled Before Ferguson, Beyond Ferguson, which the Pulitzer Center is supporting and which is, at the f which is the focus of our discussion tonight. This project spurred by the police shooting of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014, and the work of a subsequent commission on racial equality, focuses on minority families that lived and worked just a few miles from Ferguson for a good part of both the 20th and 21st centuries. The stories, authored by a team of journalists, present a family saga that portrays the everydayness of the interviewee subjects' lives in the 1920s and 1930s, right up to the present day, with a special focus on the struggle over generations to obtain a quality education. One family portrayed in Dick's reporting in the Washington, is the Washington family. Uh, Teddy Washington, uh, an economics major at Washington University, and I note here a pitcher for their baseball team, uh, joins Dick in the conversation today, and he is our uh, prodigal panelist at this moment. He should be coming in shortly. Uh, the Washington family came to Dick's attention after Teddy was the victim of a 2018 racial profiling incident at an IHOP restaurant in Clayton, Missouri. Also joining Dick and Teddy is Wesley Lowry of the Washington Post. Wesley was a lead on the Post Fatal Force Project that won the Pulitzer Prize for National Reporting in 2016, and he's the author of They Can't Kill Us All, Ferguson, Baltimore, and a New Era in America's Racial Justice Movement. And moderating our conversation tonight is Dr. Emerald Christopher Bird. Emerald is an assistant professor of women's and gender studies at the University of Delaware and lecturer on, of women's and gender, gender studies at Georgetown University. Her research focuses on institutional and sociocultural violence against black women. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming our speakers uh, today. So I'll turn it over to you, Emerald. Thank you. Yeah. So Teddy's Good there, evening, please. and Teddy will be joining us Getting shortly. <laughs> Uh, and I'll leave time towards the end to uh, open up uh, questions <coughs> from the audience. Uh, but I'd like to start uh, with talking about what has changed or what do you see has ch have changed in uh, Ferguson since um, the Michael Brown shooting. One of the things that uh, we frequently know is that the media gives us just a glimpse of the overall, the overall racial injustice issues, but we know that it runs deeper. 
Uh, we know that based on these incidents, there has been more conversations about racial profiling, but has anything changed? Well, uh, what's changed is it really is the, is the conversation. Uh, the words racial equity was not in the parlance, uh, shall we say, of very many people in uh, my community. And when we, we talk about Ferguson, we're really talking about the St. Louis area. Uh, Ferguson is in St. Louis County. St. Louis County has 89 municipalities, of which Ferguson is one. Uh, some of those uh, municipalities are uh, pretty bad in uh, many respects uh, around these issues, and some of them are better. None are, I would say, excellent. Mm -hmm. uh, real policy reform uh, not taking place uh, to a great extent yet, uh, but it's now in the conversation where it wasn't before. Uh, people are being held to account and being asked uh, intelligent uh, questions and um, uh, so I guess I choose to be optimistic. Good, good. Me too. Have you noticed any changes? Want me to add? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I, I would concur, or, or concur with a lot of that. I think that a few things are true. I think the first is that the conversation we're having today is unquestionably different, more mature, more considered, more contextualized than the conversation we were having previously. This is mm -hmm. true not just about racial equity or issues of racial equity broadly, but even true specifically around issues like policing and policing policy, right? We all know much more than we knew previously. I think about the work, uh, for example, that my colleagues and I did at the Washington Post. When Michael Brown was killed in, on August 9th, 2014, we didn't know how many people were killed each day in America by American police. We didn't know how many of them were unarmed, how many of them were black, how many were men, how many were women. It was, there was an absence of that information. Uh, today, that's not true. Today, we have databases like the one that, that we still run at the Post that is relative real time, tells you how many fatal police shootings have happened. You can sort them and look at them uh, depending on, on, on different characters, uh, characteristics. And so we have more information than we did previously. If you think about you know, when the demonstrations and the protests first happened in Ferguson, much of the conversation in the media or much of the conversation broadly was about well, what's everyone so upset about? How often do these shootings really happen? Uh, and if the officer did anything wrong, well, won't he get punished for this? Why won't everyone just wait and see what happens, right? We now collectively know a lot more about how these processes work than we did previously. We've watched cases, all of us, and, and this isn't about weighing in on any individual or given case, but basically every person out there has at some point watched a video in the last few years and goes, well, I was skeptical of all the other ones, but that guy should have been dead. <laughs> or the cop didn't need to do that thing, right? It's funny, as someone who's covered and written about a lot of these cases, I've got my regulars. I have my, guy, my, my readers who write in after every shooting. Well, you're just making excuses for them again, or why is this the cops? And even them, and it's interesting because it's a different one for each of them, they'll go, every other person deserved it. But did you see this Walter Scott video? That was crazy. I can't believe the cop did that. Or did you see the... And so we collectively now all have a different education and understanding of how this system and how these structures work, um, which has allowed, I think, us to have a more productive public conversation about uh, how the system perhaps should be changed or tweaked. Wonderful. Thank you. Welcome, Teddy. Thank you. Yes, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so one of the most striking things I found um, about your work, Dick, is the uh, transgenerational uh, issues around racism and the experience of racism within families. Uh, and Teddy's story was one of those stories. Uh, so if you could give us a moment, Teddy, and tell us a little bit about you and your family and uh, your family's overall experience uh, with uh, racism and or profiling. Gotcha. Um, so we were all born and raised in St. Louis, even from my great grandma, who was born in 1927. And this process with Dick, it, it intrigued me to talk to her about things of, of race. So it was super interesting to see, like when she was born in 1927 and she grew up in St. Louis in St. Louis City, her experiences of life were a lot different than mine in, in respect to race because of the, the, the boundaries that she had. So like there were things where she legitimately couldn't cross certain boundaries as far as uh, where she could live and where she could even be, be seen. 
So that was a difference from when talking to her and then talking to my grandmother when she said, we could still move to certain places, but there was a different, there was a, 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 a more implicit, um, I guess, form of race uh, mm -hmm. that, that, that she had to experience. But coming to my mom and I, there was a, there was a, there was a not like an awakening, but there was a, um, I guess like a, I don't know, it was, it's, it's, I'm still trying to get my bears, <laughs> trying to get them, but um, there was, there was, Okay, so starting with my great grandmother, um, it touched me to see the day to day uh, battles that she fought. So, a lot of the things that she said that happened to her, as far as the name she was called, and um, how her mother and father explained to her what you can and cannot do, were, that is what changed generationally. So going from her to how I said the legitimate physical boundaries that she couldn't break mm -hmm. were very, very clear. Then to my grandmother, there was a sense of understanding how St. Louis was changing economically and racially. So she grew up on North, in North City. And when she was growing up in, I guess, the 50s to the 70s, there was a different um, feeling in the neighborhood. So like, uh, there, were, there, were, there were still flourishing black neighborhoods in St. Louis. But when that shifted from the 60s to the 80s, there was, a, there was a sense of this part of St. Louis is being left behind. But it was in a different way than it was for my great grandmother. So it wasn't as explicit. Like it wasn't saying, this is your neighborhood and we're doing X because you are black. But this, is, this was when St. Louis was starting to transition economically in how they're allocating resources. Mm -hmm. So I could see, I could just talk to her and saying that she could see how the, the city was just, it was, that part of the city was just being left behind. So that was something that changed. And then from now, at least in my, in my experience, I've had a sort of awakening in this process with Dick because there was like the IHOP thing. There were parts of me that I've, I've read statistics about how African Americans are treated in the United States, but this was, it was, it was strictly through, through statistics and books. Mm -hmm. But when these things happened to me, it, it, uh, it made me question, um, one, what I was doing, you know, as far as like, I'm, I'm just reading these statistics and I'm not, I'm understanding them and I'm understanding how people are being affected, but I'm also not doing any legitimate work to, to address these problems because they weren't very much in my face because of how I think just race and, and, diff and how it changes, gen how race, how I have interacted with racial issues generationally, how that's changed generationally, so if that makes any sense yeah, we, at we all. should probably, uh, I don't know if everybody had a chance to actually read the story about yeah. Teddy and his family, but just one thing you should know is that uh, essentially what happened was uh, Teddy and a group of friends, 10, uh, all people of color, go to an IHOP in uh, Clayton, which is a fairly well-to-do community, late at night. Uh, they have uh, the pancakes, they leave, and around the same time, uh, two black uh, young men, I believe, uh, did a dine and dash, if you know what that is, essentially left without paying the bill. And uh, the IHOP manager calls the police. The first group of uh, people of color that they uh, find is this group of uh, 10 Washington University students walking down the street back to the uh, Metrolink to get back to the campus, which is about three miles away. Yeah. And uh, interesting, uh, the students were scared to death uh, because their cop cars pull up, they're police, they're armed. Uh, uh, according to one account, uh, one of the uh, uh, officers kind of has his hand on his weapon they know enough that this is the town where Ferguson happened, and if they do something wrong, or at least perceived to be wrong, that, you know, in their heads, they could be lying dead on the street, okay? That's, they bring, everybody brings their own biography to a story. The police, on the other hand, uh, are intervening in this incident, and they're thinking, well, we're outnumbered, 
we better be careful, okay? Mm -hmm. Things that happen in their, in their experience around Ferguson and so on. So it's all resolved fairly amicably, I think you would agree, Teddy, but they felt, the students felt that they were being racially profiled. And um, Teddy, Teddy's family filed a complaint with the uh, Clayton Police Department about this. They were not going to the media. They went through proper channels. And why would Teddy's family go through proper channels? Well, because Teddy's uh, kin uh, were uh, police officers, a number of them. And in fact, uh, your great uncle, I believe, yeah. it was a, a former chief of police in the city of St. Louis. Uh, a, a godfather, also related by marriage, was also a former uh, chief of police in the city of St. Louis. Uh, one of his uncles was a first black uh, chief of detectives in St. Louis. So uh, they respect law enforcement. Nobody knew this at the time. This is later reporting. So uh, what happened was that uh, the reason why Teddy ended up on CNN and uh, other places, uh, just became a national story, is that somebody at Washington University said, uh, people need to know about what happened that night. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's some history uh, around Washington University and its treatment of African Americans, and uh, it became a thing. Even though, uh, unlike Ferguson, nobody got hurt, it ended amicably, and so what was interesting to me as a storyteller was this sort of paradox. Um, there's a man uh, who was shot and killed uh, three year, four years earlier, I guess, by then, uh, left in the street for hours upon hours. It was egregious. Uh, even if you could uh, justify, say this, that shooting was justified um, legally, it was an egregious example of the treatment of African American citizens. This one was different. And yet I wanted to look at, well, why, why would that be? Why, I wanted to explain, especially maybe to white readers, why this would be so upsetting to these students, mm -hmm. to these families. So, sorry, it takes a while. No, 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 you're fine. Um, and Teddy, you brought up a great point when you said you read books and you saw the statistics and it was kind of an abstract and it wasn't until that moment where you had that experience did it all come together for you. Can you talk a little bit about, um, that internal or that, that trauma that comes with walking down the street knowing that there's this history that happened uh, and police pulling you over. Because one of the things that we will see on CNN, one of the things that we can read in newspapers is that it was a horrible event, but we can't really get that emotion um, from the individual person. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, so it was, it was almost, it's kind of, it was, because I, I, play, I play baseball and it, as soon as that happened, I, it was the same kind of adrenaline rush feeling. So it was like, it was, it was, I was coming aware of like the, 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 the severity of the situation. So like how you're saying, like I've read these stories over and over again. Mm -hmm. and it was almost like I was just talking with my friends and I was, I was snapped right into there, right into one of those situations. So it, it, it's, it's, it was very, very, it was, it was a, just like an extreme shock. That's all, it's all I can kind of put it, put, it, put it into words. But yeah, it was almost like time kind of sl just slowed down. And I, I realized that, yeah, this is, it's not, it's, this is the beginning of a situation that could turn very, very bad. So it, it's one, being aware of myself and how I'm acting and, and just how I, I initially knew I, how I had to maintain just poise in that situation rather than I, like, you know, I know exactly what this is, you know? So it's, it's, it, it was super hard to, to bring myself into like a, 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 a um, I don't know, like a, a just a, a quick. Uh, I, I, yeah. Just looking at it from the outside, Teddy, seemed to me was so, without really knowing it, was so well prepared for the moment without actually having experienced it. Mm -hmm. um, he knew, uh, it was interesting across generations as he was explaining, his, his grandparents had endured a lot, his parents 
had endured a lot, and yet Teddy told me that this was his first experience being racially profiled. And I said, really? You're 18, you're a, a tall African-American kid, probably wore a hoodie every so often around town and so on. This had nev never happened to him, and yet uh, he had been put in situations, um, his grade school, where he was not singled out or f felt different. Uh, basically a Catholic school, um, about 50-50, white and black. Uh, unlike his parents, uh, Teddy, uh, even though his parents had white friends and were part of the desegregation program, they were never invited to a white family's home, like, you know, hang out. Teddy had that experience. Your, you know, your best buddies were white kids and you were in their homes and they were in yours and it was uh, a fairly normal experience uh, by what we, what we think ought to be normal. And so he knew something when this happened, something was off, even if he didn't have that um, personal experience up to that point. He got to his freshman year in college, living, um, as you said, a privileged life, or what you felt was privileged. And so. what I think that really speaks to is um, part of the stories that you tell is how uh, African American families in particular pass that knowledge to their children in very different ways. Uh, so Teddy and others are equipped with that knowledge without having experienced it before. Um, uh, Wesley, I want to ask you a question uh, regarding your book. You, you talk about uh, the various cities uh, where uh, some of these shootings have happened. Uh, in terms of resilience of the people in these cities and uh, around the U.S., have you observed in your research at all or conversations with people how religion might play a role in that resilience? So I, I don't know that I've looked at that question specifically, but I think anecdotally the, you know, first of all, the role of religion has always been kind of central to the story of African American resilience, um, be it as a organizing uh, structure as well as an educational system, uh, as a means of centralizing and organizing financially, mm -hmm. as a means of disseminating information, um, be it uh, current events, to where, you know, which doors are friendly to knock on if you're fleeing slavery, right? Mm -hmm. the, um, the, the religion in black America has always been a, a central uh, organizing tenet. And when you look at the resilience of uh, the cities that have, over the last five years, seen protest demonstrations, unrest, uh, and, and, and shootings um, captured on tape and otherwise, very often uh, among the leaders and, and the folks who are attempting to both quell frustration and anger, but also trying to hold powerful people to account, very often uh, you're seeing people um, who are clergy in some capacity, right? Mm -hmm. And so. Uh, you know, it's interesting, right? I think I think that there is a you know one thing that's broadly true, right, is that we are a less churched nation today than we were previously generationally, right? And so, and I think some cities have encountered that as a, a difficulty, right? There's unrest, there are people in the street, and the you know, and the local council person calls the five pastors he knows, but those five pastors between them get twenty people in their pews every Sunday. Mm -hmm. Uh, that person showing up in the streets may not, you know, might not be particularly effective um, at calming things or reassuring people, right? Versus you have other cities where there are members of clergy um, who, who do have and do play the kind of traditional role of community leaders and have voices that are listened to and, and know people. And, and so it looks a little different depending on where, on where you are. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Every one of the stories that we've done in our project have involved faith. And the fourth story that we're working on now is about a minister. So we're not gonna get, get away from faith mm -hmm. there. What was, uh, to me, was um, uh, really helpful, uh, just as a journalist, is that part of the way I under, was able to understand the Washington family was that 
Teddy's mom and dad were in fellow, a fellowship group at their church, and they were asked to write about their lives and how faith moved them. And so a lot of the detail that's in Teddy's story comes from their witnessing. They wrote it down. Mm -hmm. They wrote it down. I had it. I was like, I uh, felt in some, almost like a stenographer uh, because it was so beautiful uh, what they said. What is also interesting, Teddy, uh, I hope you'll speak to this, they didn't share that with Teddy, uh, a lot of it, um, till recently. And actually, maybe my getting nosy and bringing them <laughs> into, the, into this uh, project uh, maybe catalyzed that. But there was a lot of stuff that's really hard and not the kind of thing you're going to talk to a six-year-old about. Teddy's uncle was murdered when you were six. Uh, how do you how do you you know get into that with with your six year old? Uh, and there's there's other material that they felt that they didn't want to uh, scare their children, make them fear white people, um, and on the other hand, they wanted them to keep them safe. And uh, so there's certain things you do have to share with your children as they grow up that white folk don't have to. And you might want to talk speak to that. Yeah, I, I feel like the, the, the interesting thing that comes to mind is just like how black people say they have the talk with their children. Mm -hmm. And I feel like uh, my parents did the same thing with me, but it was in a way that was a lot less, um, not less, uh, I don't know, less, less harsh. So I feel like they, they tried to make sure that I had that knowledge, um, but more in a way that was of repetition and things that I could say that I was like, I would sometimes tell my mom, I was like, I know, I know, you know, when I'm leaving, like, I know, don't just drive slow, be mm -hmm. safe, you know, that kind of thing. But there were things that Dick talks to that there was a way that when I was old enough to understand the things that they were talking to me about, it, it forced me to look at their role as parents and what they're trying to do and what they're trying to say, how Dick said, they, were, they weren't trying to make me afraid of the world, but at the same time, they wanted, wanted me to be prepared and aware. So I feel like that kind of touched when I was pulled over by the police. At the same time, I was, I was kind of scared, but at the same time, I was, I was able to recognize what was going on, and I was able to understand what I needed to do and what I needed to make sure, just my group of friends, how, how just, just make sure that I used the knowledge that my parents had given me, and I used it in a way that could make sure that not only we get out of this situation, but also I was aware enough to know that this isn't right mm -hmm. for people that, that don't have that kind of the, the knowledge or like the note to just not even the knowledge but the the, um, the the maybe not the lack of fear or something but or in a way that pushes me to say that that wasn't right and I feel like that was only possible from what my parents had taught me. So. The, they did some subtle things. Teddy went to uh, St. Louis University High School. It's a Jesuit high school. Got a great reputation. When Teddy got a car, a sticker, St. Louis U High is on the back of that car. So uh -huh. a, a, an officer would know that this is a person, you know, uh, again, playing on a stereotype. And it mm -hmm. could maybe terrible people go to St. Louis University High School. But, <laughs> but you know, that's a little thing, a little mm -hmm. thing that they, that they did um, to protect their son. And, uh, and uh, I imagine a Wash U sticker went on there, there that was, too. I was just gonna say that, yeah. As soon as my mom was very adamant that I had a Wash U sticker before the suit came off. The suit, I was like, yeah. you and have then, to have. And then in your high school experience, uh, your, uh, the, the way the Jesuits taught about race and religion and so on was uh, I, I, I'm pretty influential as well, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, was it Jesuit? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So yeah, it, it almost in the same nature. I feel like, just especially the, the, um, the, the routine of religion at SLU and also in, in my grade school, almost did the exact same thing my parents did. It, it was just almost like a, I was implicitly learning rules to live by, learning the, just what it means to be a man for others, or a man or a woman for others, but at SLU, a man for others. And it, it was something that was always in the back of my head and I could see myself acting through, but not in a, a, a voluntary way. It was, it was almost like just being around the Jesuits at SLU, learning about religion and learning about almost the, 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 the alumni of SLU as well and what they're doing in the world. It made it a lot, not a lot easier, but almost made it, made it natural to want to, to, 
to act in that for, in that way, mm -hmm. act, in, act for others. Yeah. And it sounds like your um, experience um, with um, IHOP really resulted in a um, and you mobilizing around uh, social justice and racial justice issues. Uh, uh, Dick and Wellesley, in your experience, what have been some other ways people have been inspired to mobilize across the country in response? If they're not living in St. Louis, if they're not living in Baltimore, um, how have people started to mobilize around this um, idea of racial and social justice? Yeah, I, th I think that we've seen a fair amount of mobilization around these issues. When, when I remember when Michael Brown was first killed in Ferguson. They, and again, this gets back thematically to the idea that we all know much more today than we did five years ago, right? Mm -hmm. One of the big questions people had was, well, what's wrong with that place? That would never happen where I live. Wait, the cops just killed some person, they left him in the street. Mo like what, uh, is this some weird Missouri backwater? I mean, Missouri's okay. kind of the South, right? Maybe that's what this is. Like, is the Klan there? You know, what's the, like, it was, and then, and then what we saw is one city becomes the next becomes the next. And even as these cities would host the exact same controversy, they would insist that they were different than what had happened in Ferguson. So Cleveland, after Tamir Rice goes, no, 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 but we're no Ferguson, Missouri, right? <laughs> Charleston, after Walter Scott, look, but this isn't a Ferguson, right? This is a Baltimore, as the city is on fire, right? Well, but no, but we're no Ferguson. Mm -hmm. That we wanted this to be a problem that happens over there, that that place must be uniquely bad, it must be uniquely wrong, and it couldn't happen where I live in my backyard. And what became increasingly clear over the course of these years was that the story of Ferguson was the story of America. Right, that it could have happened in any one of these places. One thing that's interesting, you know, we've looked at, we've analyzed what, what will end up being close to 5,000 fatal police shootings by the end of this year. Looked at all of them. There are fatal police shootings in every state in the country. There, are, this is not a big city problem. The suburban and rural police departments kill just as many people as urban. You know, it's, it's not. This is not an LA and Chicago PD problem, right? Uh, that most places, that, well, there are certainly departments that have multiple shootings a year. Uh, most places where there is a fatal police shooting, it's the only shoot, fatal police shooting of that year. It happens one time in this place, right? That this is an experience that is broadly universally American. This is something that happens out everywhere. In the same way that other questions of racial justice and racial equity are conversations that happen everywhere, right? That school segregation or housing segregation is not a problem happening over there. No matter where you live, it's happening where you are too. Uh, where, where, and so I think that, that is a, and you could take this, not just in the policing context, right? We think about you know places become shorthands. Ferguson becomes shorthand for something, right? In the same way, Flint has become shorthand. Well, guess what? There are lead crises in every major city in the United States of America, right? The, and and so again, I think one of the things that's difficult is the desire very often to believe these are problems that are elsewhere. What that said, I do think a lot of people have realized in the last few years precisely this, right? That these problems that they care about, these things that they're watching, are things that they can do work on wherever they live, right? We live in a country with 18,000 police departments. They're all run locally. Their, their policies, their, whether or not their body camera video, uh, camera footage is available, much less if they even have cameras in the first place. What their use of force policy is, how they hire and fire, who their chief is, those are all things that are decisions made at a local level. That a few people showing up to a city council meeting or writing a letter to their mayor does ha have the possibility to make a real impact in a way that changes people's lives. And so I think what we see is the ability for us to so quickly see and hear about what's happening across the country has allowed folks to turn their outrage and their anger and apply it directly to try to influence changes in the places where they are. Yeah, um, these police shootings are catalytic. They get people interested and involved. Uh, they tend to make people want to take sides in the immediate aftermath, but it, does, it starts the conversation. But uh, what we can't lose sight of is that um, our system has been killing African Americans, what we might call softly. Remember that song, "Killing Me Softly." I'm not sure that that, that Roberta Flack's lyrics work <laughs> otherwise, but they've been killing African Americans softly 
for generations. If you, there's a sheet there on your chair. If you want to take a look at that, that would be instructive. Um, it shows the uh, difference between Clayton, where Teddy had his incident, and 63, that was 63105, and 63106, uh, comparing the, what we call the social determinants of health. If you were born in 63106, actually close to where uh, Teddy's uh, grandma and grandpa continue to live and where his mom was raised, um, think of that neighborhood and then think of that, the, the Clayton neighborhood. You are going to, actuarially, you're going to live uh, to uh, 67 years old only in 63106. And in 63105, you're going to live to be, I believe it's 84 years old. This can be proven because of lack of access to health care, food deserts. Actually, crime is less of a factor than you might think. But um, I grew up uh, about 50 yards from uh, 63105, uh, so I can expect to live to be 87. And by the way, I just turned 68, so if I had been born in uh, 63106, actuarily, I'm dead. I'm dead. Uh, we need to help uh, people of privilege understand this, what's going on and what needs to change as a result. My feeling, uh, I, my project actually was inspired um, uh, in part by Isabel Wilkerson, who mm -hmm. you probably know. She wa wrote a book called uh, The Warmth of Other Sons, and she traced families generationally, um, just as I have done, so I'm, I'm a copycat. Mm -hmm. uh, and she wrote uh, something that powerfully moved me. Uh, and I'll just read a little section if you'll know, bear with me. It says, Wilkerson believes changing laws and public policy is important but insufficient. She calls for radical empath empathy, to put ourselves inside the experience of others, to allow ourselves the pain, allow ourselves the heartbreak, allow ourselves the sense of hopelessness that they are experiencing. And so Wilkerson says, I view myself as on kind of a mission to change the country, the world, one heart at a time. I feel as if the heart is the last frontier because we have tried so many other things. And so our project is designed uh, not only to do this generationally, but to have people who are unwoke uh, wake up to the pain and to develop a radical empathy so they will want to do something. So they will be citizens, good citizens. And you both raised some really good points, especially the, um, uh, the point, Leslie, that you made talking about uh, people working at the local level and what they can do. I think oftentimes people become overwhelmed by what they see in the news and uh, would then say, well, what can I do? Uh, especially if I'm here, um, it's a much bigger issue, what can I do? Uh, and Teddy, when you talked about your family and how your great-grandmother literally had a barrier where it was, um, she knew and pe other people knew where she could go and where she could not go. And today we have uh, those covert barriers of food deserts, of um, lack of access to health care, resulting in uh, premature death, uh, in particular African Americans and those living um, in low income areas. Uh, I will be opening it up for questions in a minute, but um, I want to be sure to uh, ask you, Teddy, uh, about the mobilization that might be potentially happening at your home institution. Uh, we shared with you uh, some of the history of Georgetown, and we have some students in the audience. Georgetown has really been trying to deal with its um, past history of um, slavery and uh, working on reconciliation and social justice, and a lot of that uh, was spearheaded by our students on campus uh, talking about how this impacts them and their experience here. Can you talk a little bit um, if there's anything happening at your home institution in relation to mobilization? Gosh, yeah, I don't, I don't know if WashU's doing as much as you guys, especially as far as your, the aid that mm -hmm. you guys are starting to do. But 
at least with we just got a new chancellor, and something that I really liked that he that he is pushing is that WashU shouldn't only be a research institution in extremely high level subjects. I think to be in like one of the, the most racially segregated cities in the nation and be a research institution with just in, in, uh, an enormous amount of cash and capital to use, there should be a major role that WashU should play from a research perspective in just correcting practical issues in St. Louis, being so close to those kind of, um, being so close to the, 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 the uh, like, bold racism, you know, especially economically and even physically as far as like how police interactions happen. But uh, there's a lot of talk of practical research, and practical research application in St. Louis. I think uh, WashU we sponsor Kip, Kip St. Louis, which is a, a charter school in St. Louis, which one, one of my best friends went to, coming from, it's, yeah, it's six from Edsel, which is, yeah. So it's like right in an area where it's like the chances of you making it out of there are very, very slim. And it's something that I can tangibly see that WashU has done and that it's actually helped a ton of people, a ton of friends that I know that have gotten out of those kind of situations and gotten into the positions that they should have just as much access to and just as much of a right to than their, their counterparts that are in different zip codes. But yeah, I think what Georgetown is doing is, is big, but I also think that I like that there's, there's, a, there's a tangible uh, way to measure your, your effort. So I think research does a lot, but there's, 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 there's a, a, a real value of financial or um, just physical like schools. There's, there, there can be tangible research, but I think there should be more of a shift too, and I think the chance was definitely doing. If you're in an area where uh, the the institution is uh, facing issues within the city, but then not having a relationship with the city itself, uh, so hopefully the chancellor will continue to look at that a little bit more. Uh, but I do want to open up the floor for questions. If anyone would like to ask the panelists questions, and I see a hand in the back. Hi, um, Teddy, I was wondering if you could speak to the conversation with your parents about deciding to file um, a complaint, um, whether that was something you talked about together beforehand. Um, yeah, it was kind of more of my parents' knowledge, I want to say. Um, cause I was at, it was, the incident happened prior to my freshman year, so I was in like, almost like an exam season of <laughs> like, prior to freshman year. So it was, the event happened in, Wash you alerted my parents, and at the same time, I let them know at the same time. At, at the same time, and like, they were the ones that were really saying that were really pushing. Like, you should definitely do something. You should. We definitely need to file a complaint. So that that really sparked me. So that conversation was one. It was uh, very quick in a sense of they were going to file a complaint, and they were just making sure I knew it was wrong. It's like you you know that wasn't right, and I was like, yeah, I do know that wasn't right. At the same time, they knew exactly what to do. Like I didn't know, like even from like a, a a practical standpoint, I was like, the process of filing a complaint in Clayton, Missouri. I was like, I don't I don't know what the first step is to that. But the conversation was very very short, especially with my mom and my dad. It was yeah, this is definitely this definitely needs to happen. But it, it was yeah, so it was it was a short conversation. But. Other questions? I thought I saw a hand over here. Yes. Do you believe based on the research that you have done that you believe based on the research that you have done that a police officer today, either in your location or anywhere else in the country, would be less likely to shoot a unarmed black man than when Michael Brown was shot? Uh, so I, I guess I'm gonna answer but not answer that question. I because we know what we know, but we still don't know what we don't know. So for example, we know that the police in America fatally shoot three people every day, about 1,000 people every year. We do not know how many people they shoot who live. Um, we know that the number of unarmed black people who, who have been shot and killed has dropped um, in the time since Michael Brown was killed. Again, we don't know how many unarmed black people have been shot but have lived. 
And, and so the statistics can be tough. A city, a police department can go um, in one year and have five fatal police shootings and the next year have zero. And the reason for that change cannot be anything about the officer shooting less or different policies. It can be because their shootings all happen closer to an ER. Or, or the p police officers this year were worse shots than the ones last year, right? That so much of what happens in these incidents uh, is chance. Uh, and, and so without knowing about more information about non-fatal police shootings, it's hard to know and hard to gauge, right? One of the questions we all have, um, all of us, is is this getting better or is this getting worse? And all of our, everything we have suggests that things are staying pretty much the same in terms of how often police are using this type of force, um, how often the people killed are black, how often they're women, how often they're unarmed, um, and how rarely police officers are charged with crimes for them. And so every, all the indicators we have suggest that things nationally have largely stayed the same, even as any number of departments have overhauled policies Add, added things like cameras, sent their, their officers to do trainings. At the national level, there's not much to suggest that things have drastically changed in terms of the outcomes. Um, I have a two-pronged question. Um, as a result of your uh, complaint, um, did you find that your work that the police department responded in a fashion that created a dialogue so that they could learn from that experience or did they just brush it off? That was one question. And the other one is um, we live in this media culture where we have, let's say, the mainstream media coming in and helicoptering in their their trucks and and taking it as a flashpoint, but they don't necessarily follow up over weeks and months and years after an experience to give their readership a real sense as to what an impact of this sort of event has. So in a sense, they in a sense profile these events through their own helicoptering lens. Do you find that they, they do you find that it needs a lot of work to be able to bring the subtlety of what happens, like what happens to a community from such an event, and how can, let's say, the we learn about what that means? And I think that's that. That was my question: is how can we go beyond just simply the flashpoint reading to really see how what an effect that these sort of events have? those questions. Um, uh, Wesley was in the position of, we don't call it helicoptering in, we call it parachuting in, <laughs> parachuting in, but same thing. And uh, what uh, Wesley did was, uh, unlike uh, many other news organizations, he kept after it. In fact, he just had a story about um, the uh, eyewitness to the shooting, uh, Dorian, I forget his last Dorian name. Johnson. Dorian Johnson. What, few weeks ago, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, he comes back. He uh, followed up after the incident with serious uh, research uh, led to the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, uh, and so there is that kind of news organization. Uh, it, it, it brings to bear uh, the Washington Post. A is serious. They're well resourced and they had a very talented uh, journalist uh, to, to put on the story and it did a, he did a great job. There are others who yeah, they do move on, and they just, uh, they're there for the flashpoint, and they come back, maybe they'll come, they, many came back for the five-year anniversary and did their stories, then they, they left it. Uh, from my standpoint, as a local journalist, um, you're talking about the change in the community. Uh, so I wrote this story about Teddy, and it involved the, the city of Clayton, which uh, some residents called uh, the Emerald City. The Emerald City, if you're uh, Wizard of Oz fans, you know, what that is, and uh, a, a wonderful progressive place, and yet this community has been called out uh, and uh, as racist. Um, the city of Clayton 
it went 60-40 for Hillary Clinton in the, in the election. There are people in Clayton who are, well, a lot of from the university, so they're, generally speaking, going to be progressive on racial issues, but they haven't gotten race right in Clayton, and there are many people who want to. And after the incident was investigated and um, uh, some consultants uh, examined it and they felt that the police had acted appropriately under the circumstances, not necessarily the city fathers, not necessarily the um, people who, uh, at the IHOP uh, and so on, but the police were asked to respond to the scene. And they did what they were, they were asked to do. Uh, Clayton uh, could have uh, just gone like this. Oh, we're all done with that matter. But instead, the mayor, who was um, defended the police and was called everything up to being a, me uh, uh, a member of the Ku Klux Klan, he, he decided uh, he wanted to try to fix this issue. And so he um, pioneered, uh, got started uh, a racial equity commission. Uh, he was term limited, so he has passed on this um, job, this work, to the new mayor. And my job, I feel my job, is to see if they're really going to fix it. Are they really serious about what they want to do? And uh, that's my next story. I'm actually hoping I can get Wesley to help me get it into the Washington <laughs> Post. Can you, so you can, you can read about it. But it's so interesting that this is the... Uh, uh, the paradox at work here is that this uh, brouhaha took place in uh, the most progressive and wealthiest community in, uh, in the St. Louis area. And if they can't fix it, you know, you tend to think, well, then nobody can. And will they? And do they really, really want to? And this is going to unfold over the next um, year or two. And we'll know in the end whether they're serious. And... Uh, we're going to stay on top of it because I think actually the media scrutiny will uh, keep them on task. Other questions? Yeah. We have a question over here. Thank you all for coming here this evening. I spent eight years in St. Louis, um, four at St. Louis University, and then four helping implement a lot of the Ferguson Commission recommendations, particularly okay. around youth at the center. Um, in the Ferguson Commission report, I would encourage everybody to, you know, pull it up on your phone. Um, they did a beautiful job weaving together many complex issues around policing, child well-being, and also housing. Um, and hearing the story of uh, your family, Teddy, really brought to light, as now I'm a business and law student uh, here at Georgetown, many of the housing issues in St. Louis and property issues and how that impacts education um, and well-being today. Um, and I was struck by, in my property class, St. Louis has been highlighted as what not to do uh, it, uh, from the past hundred years. Um, but my professor had a study, Ledoux's zoning policy passed in 2015, um, and really saw the legacy of you know, racial covenants in St. Louis saying you can't live here, to implicit housing policy saying you kinda can't live on this block. Um, to many things still being alive today. And I learned for the first time, thousands of miles away from St. Louis, that in Ladue, th literally the 2015 zoning policy prohibits multifamily units. Um, and so I'm struck with this idea of the power of information um, and how the power of information around police brutality has changed the national conversation. And so I'm curious where you see the, house the, the housing and education conversation beginning to come together in a different way, um, and how we can hold, whether it's municipalities, like the 89 in St. Louis, or cities, um, to really rethink um, how we need to live in our communities and what that means for the next generation. Teddy's uh, dad uh, is a middle school math teacher in Ladue, uh, so there's that. The, um, you know, I think, it's, I think it's really smart that you brought up housing this way because I think very often we talk about issues of racial equity and talk about issues of segregation in an educational context, but educational segregation is downstream from housing segregation because we go to school where we live. Um, and, we, and so unless we undo the fact that we have grouped and sorted ourselves the way that we have and have tr 
locked certain people into certain places with other outcomes and excluded them from other places, it's imp it, it, we're trying to solve the problem at the end of it as opposed to at the beginning of it, right? Um, and, and I think one issue, I think zoning is an issue that particularly is not discussed as often as it should be in terms of how it relates to these. Um, I'm, I'm sure you've read, but anyone else should, should definitely check out The Color of Law by Richard, uh, Richard Rothstein, which is a, a brilliant look at how um, his argument is that our, uh, the, the segregation that remains in our society was in fact codified and, in, and created by government action. He's making an argument that um, because of that, the, the Supreme Court and other courts should be able to force places to desegregate um, and to change their zoning laws or to change their schools around. But there is a real uh, discussion to be had about where we live, who we allow to live around us, what those decisions mean down the, down the road. Um, and so, look, a, a well-intentioned person can argue that the reason they don't want a public housing complex or an apartment building down their street is they, they're worried it's gonna hurt their property value. And they can mean that, and they can say that and mean that, and it doesn't have to be about malice at all, uh, to not negate the, ne the necessity to ask the follow-up question of, well, then what does that mean? Then who is being excluded from, that commu from this community? Uh, then what does that mean for whose children will be in schools with your children? What does, you know, again, decisions we make have consequences and have outcomes. And what we know in the aggregate is that we have collectively all made decisions to live in a relatively racially segregated country, city after city after city after city. And that means that our children attend racially and socioeconomically segregated schools. And so, th so there's a massive conversation to be had around those issues, around what a government's responsibility is um, to address those. Uh, so you have, we've seen some cities now in the last year or two, um, there have been several cities that have outright banned single family zoning. Uh, that, that no matter where you live in the city, you have to be able to build basically any type of, of home. Again, the, the hope, their hope being that this would begin to desegregate their cities, right? But there's an open question, and there's, and, and there's open conversation about it. I think uh, that was a long way of saying, I think that uh, the housing conversation isn't had enough when I think it is foundational to a real conversation about how our, to what extent our country is integrated or not. The, it's interesting. Um, the outcomes are really never predictable. Uh, the Ledoux School District, uh, not only is it a place where uh, uh, Teddy's dad teaches, his sister goes to Ledoux High School. Um, to get into, uh, you don't have to live in Ledoux proper to go to Ledoux High School, which is actually called Horton Watkins. Uh, and you can live in a town of Olivet, which is a little bit less uh, ritzy. Uh, Olivet does have uh, multifamily units. Um, so, and I think your sister's experience at Ledoux has been nice, right? Pretty, pretty good. And um, she's, uh, so Ledoux isn't the worst. Actually, there's some uh, private schools, uh, John Burroughs uh, is also in Ledoux, and uh, um, um, Mary Institute Country Day School called MICDS, which actually does some great diversity work. Um, so we shouldn't uh, necessarily stereotype or typecast people who are wealthy or live in wealthy communities uh, as, you know, necessarily bad. Everybody can be better, for sure. Um, but there are interesting communities to look, look at. But what Wesley said is, is true, and what you're saying is true is that the housing patterns and the redlining and the steering and the boundaries and the zoning also contribute to um, go right back fundamentally, higher death rates, higher death rates. Not fair, gotta fix it. I'm afraid we are out of time. Please join me in thanking our panelists this evening.